empowering and greener tomorrow. Mayor, Mayor Yorty has just sent me a message that we've been here too long already. So, uh, my thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Thank you. A heated U.S. presidential campaign, this one 40 years ago. The candidate, Senator Robert F. Kennedy, brother of the assassinated President John F. Kennedy. Now, Bobby Kennedy had just won the California Democratic primary in early June 1968. Despite his impressive victory, Kennedy was still far from securing his party's nomination. As RFK told a reporter that night, we'll just have to struggle for it. But... Only moments after these pictures were captured in a Los Angeles hotel ballroom, Kennedy and five bystanders were shot as the senator passed through a narrow kitchen pantry just off the ballroom. The young presidential candidates died the next day. A 24-year-old Jordanian, Serhan Serhan, was arrested for the crime, having been captured in the pantry immediately after firing an Ivor Johnson cadet revolver. Today, Serhan is serving a life sentence for the assassination, but now... Two forensic experts say there's new evidence that casts serious doubt on whether Sirhan was guilty of the Kennedy murder. So what has led you to conclude that there was someone other than Sirhan who was shooting at uh, Robert Kennedy? Yes, we've uh, concluded that Sirhan, Sirhan not only did not shoot Senator Kennedy, but could not have shot Senator Kennedy. And the reason for that is Sirhan was never in a position where he could shoot Senator Kennedy from behind. And Senator Kennedy was shot four times from behind. Three of the bullets entered his body and one went through his suit coat at the right upper seam. In addition to that, five other victims were shot and no single bullet hit more than one person. Therefore, there were nine bullets into people that had to be accounted for. And that was the minimum amount of bullets. Sirhan's gun only held eight bullets. As a result, there was a question from the very beginning, how was that possible to get nine shots out of an eight-shot revolver? And of course, that was never answered by the investigating officers. Philip Van Prague, you, you've reanalyzed a, a poor quality audio recording of uh, the, the killing of Robert Kennedy. Uh, uh, what did you find? Well, there were 13 shot sounds that uh, I found on that recording uh, up to the point where the screams just totally overrode all of the other audio and it would have been impossible to recover any shot sounds beyond that point. So the discovery of 13 shot sounds in and of itself establishes a second gun from the standpoint of Sirhan's capacity being only eight shots. The second discovery was the presence of two double shot instances, and that is two shots that occur so closely together as to preclude the possibility of having come from a single weapon. There were two such instances of those double shots. The third discovery, which was an outgrowth of the first two, was the discovery of a frequency anomaly that occurred with five of the shot sounds. That frequency anomaly was later matched in an independent uh, firearms test uh, on a firing range that duplicated that frequency anomaly with one of the two weapons, that frequency anomaly not being present on the Ivor Johnson Cadet 55, but being present on the H&R 922, which has the same rifling characteristics as the Ivor Johnson. Could you just take us through uh, um, um, Pajinsky's movements with, with the microphone, that aspect of, uh, of this? Okay. At the time that the shots began, uh, Mr. Przinski was trying to catch up to the uh, Kennedy entourage. Uh, the Kennedy entourage had left by the back of the stage area and proceeded towards the kitchen pantry. Uh, Mr. Przinski, upon collecting his microphone and tape recorder, uh, proceeded down the staircase uh, to the right of the audience. Uh, and towards the uh, doorway that led to the kitchen pantry area. It was while he was descending those stairs that the shot sequence began. He was unaware of the fact that shots were being fired at the time and continued to walk toward the kitchen pantry area 
and upon arriving at the kitchen pantry, of course, then realized what had just happened and uh, subsequently continued his recording uh, for another 30 minutes or so. We have a, a, a copy of, of, of that recording. Let's, let's listen to, to part of that right now. It's very difficult to make out anything at all uh, on, the, on that tape in the, in the way of gunshots or, or anything coherent. The recording itself is of poor quality. Uh, however, uh, analyzing it with techniques that are available today, as opposed to 40 years ago or almost 40 years ago, when the FBI uh, laboratory in Washington, D.C. analyzed the recording. Uh, today, uh, we have much more modern techniques, and we're able to discern things from that recording that we we're unable to or the folks were unable to come up with uh, that long ago. Robert Joling, given all of that, do you know who killed Robert Kennedy and why? I don't know who did. I know who was in a position to have done it. And there's a difference between those two positions, as you well know. Uh, as to why he did it, whomever it was that did it, uh, that's looking into a mind of a person who uh, is not here and whom we've never examined, and therefore it's impossible really to answer that question truthfully. Robert Joling and Philip Van Prague there, and this is their book, An Open and Shut Case. You can get details on their website, anopenandshutcase.com. Coming up next, a machine.